Lifelong Learning, A Taste of Pillar 2, are short presentations taught by Pillar instructors in partnership with the Pikes Peak Library District. This program is made possible as the result of a grant from Next 50 Initiative, a nonprofit organization dedicated to funding innovative, mission-driven initiatives that improve the lives of older adults and their caregivers. Welcome to my Taste of Pillar presentation, Reading Through the Lens of Culture. And thank you for spending this time with me to explore the art of culturally responsive reading. Over the course of my academic career, I've taught literature at several colleges and universities, including UCCS and Colorado College. In 2015, I retired from the Air Force Academy where I taught for the Department of English and Fine Arts for 16 years. Since then, I've been keeping busy reading, writing, and offering workshops like this one through Pillar and the Pikes Peak Library District. I'm also the founder of Lit Unlocked, an organization that offers workshops and seminars centered on the LISP paradigm, an approach to culturally responsive reading I developed that helps readers unlock literature with four keys to culture, language, identity, space, and time. Despite renewed emphasis on diversity training, multiculturalism, and culturally responsive teaching over the past several decades, the conventional approach to reading and teaching American literature still centers predominantly on a Western paradigm based on classic Eurocentric texts, such as Homer's Odyssey, Shakespeare's plays, and the Bible. But reading non-Western literature, especially works by writers of color, through the lens of Western culture often distorts these texts and leads to egregious misreadings. To address this issue, I propose a paradigm shift to culturally responsive reading, close critical reading that foregrounds a work's culture without compromising its integrity as a literary work of art. As I hope to demonstrate during this presentation, Culturally responsive reading can dramatically enhance our reading experience and transform our relationship to the study of literature. Reflecting on his writing process, Ralph Ellison, best known for his groundbreaking novel, Invisible Man, states, one writes out of one thing only, one's experience as understood and ordered through one's knowledge of self, culture, and literature. Nobel laureate Toni Morrison, best known for her Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Beloved, expresses a similar sentiment. I don't like to find my books condemned as bad or praised as good when that condemnation or praise is based on criteria from other paradigms. I would much prefer that they were dismissed or embraced based on the success of their accomplishment within the culture out of which I write. Clearly, both of these literary legends recognize the powerful impact of culture on the creative process and the critical link between culture and literature. But what is culture? How does it impact our reading process? And what are the other paradigms to which Morrison alludes? To open our discussion of culture in my classes at the Air Force Academy, I often began with those two quotations. I then asked several cadets to share their definitions of culture. While some define culture in terms of our appreciation of the arts, such as exposing ourselves to culture by visiting museums and art galleries, others viewed it in terms of traditional dress, music, or food. Invariably, a white student, obviously enamored of black hip hop culture, bemoaned the fact that white people have no culture. This generally led us to broader explorations of culture and civilization in Western society, including the belief that black people have no culture. I would then encourage cadets to think about their early childhood experiences. What was your favorite food? Your favorite story? Who told you that story? What does it mean to you today? I asked them to try to pinpoint their initial moments of cultural awareness. This generally led us to acknowledge that as children, we are oblivious to culture, simply accepting our family traditions as 
the way things are. Our awareness of culture begins only when we step outside the circle of family, a process that often begins with the first day of school. Eventually, we arrived at a general definition of culture as the language, values, and beliefs of people that are passed on to succeeding generations. And we acknowledge that various groups create their own value systems. Consequently, we can speak of American or US culture, black culture, Asian culture, prison culture, GLBTQ plus culture, and cyber culture. We can also speak of the culture of violence, the culture of fear, and the culture of silence. My class also reflected on the observation of Anil Ramdas that, quote, culture is by definition, the observation of an outsider. And we considered Rodolfo Anaya's assertion that, quote, a novel is not written to explain a culture, it creates its own, unquote. Finally, we arrived at two fundamental truths, that language is the basis of culture and that culture shapes our perceptions of reality. Once we acknowledge these two truths, we could begin to make meaningful connections between culture and literature. And once we establish the definition of multicultural literature as works by writers historically excluded from the Western literary canon, such as women and writers of color, we could begin to explore some similarities and differences between multicultural literatures and Western Eurocentric texts. For example, we realize that simply relying on traditional methods of analyzing literature, such as learning the language of literature, symbol, metaphor, irony, illusion, exploring the reading process, pre-reading, reading, and reflection, and reviewing the elements of fiction, such as plot, setting, character, theme, and point of view was not enough. And we agreed that reading multicultural literatures through the lens of the author's culture can not only help us identify some of the unique aspects of a specific culture, it can also help us become more compassionate human beings. Given this background, my students were better prepared to access and analyze the works of Ralph Ellison, Toni Morrison, and Amy Tan, alongside the works of Shakespeare, Buckner, and Hemingway. But how can we as general readers learn to understand and appreciate the links between culture and literature? We might begin with the process of culturally responsive reading, which foregrounds a work's culture without compromising its integrity as a literary work of art. But all too often, the reading of non-Western texts devolves into a discussion of diversity and multicultural manners thereby reducing a work of literary fiction to a sociological case study that represents the experience of an entire group. In her essay, In the Canon for All the Wrong Reasons, Amy Tan expresses her frustrations with how her novel, The Joy Luck Club, is taught in the classroom. Over the years, my editor has received hundreds of permissions requests from publishers of college textbooks and multicultural anthologies, all of them wishing to reprint my work for, quote, educational purposes, unquote. One publisher wanted to include an excerpt from the Joy Luck Club, a scene in which a Chinese woman invites her non-Chinese boyfriend to her parents' house for dinner. The boyfriend brings a bottle of wine as a gift and commits a number of social gaffes at the dinner table. Students were supposed to read this excerpt then answer the following question. If you are invited to a Chinese family's home for dinner, should you bring a bottle of wine? Students reading the Joy Luck Club under such circumstances will undoubtedly miss the power of Tan's narrative, which focuses not on the proper etiquette for Chinese dinner parties, but on the relationships of mothers and daughters across four generations. Conversely, Readers may approach non-Western texts through the lens of Western Eurocentric culture, thus imposing the cultural values of, quote, the majority, unquote, on the works of minority writers. A case in point is Ellison's Invisible Man. 
Often applauded as the great novel of segregation, Invisible Man explores the life of a black man in white America who believes himself to be invisible, quote, because people refuse to see me, unquote. The Invisible Man, who serves as both narrator and protagonist, escapes from his life in the rural South, Greenwood, South Carolina, to the urban North, Harlem, New York, during the Great Migration, after being expelled from a prestigious Black college that bears a striking resemblance to Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. Determined to shed his Southern country roots, he sets out to create a new identity and shares the story of his journey, quote, from purpose to passion to perception. With its focus on the hero's journey, Invisible Man can be read as a quest narrative in the tradition of Homer's Odyssey. And with its emphasis on the narrator's journey from the naivety of youth to the rude awakening of adulthood, it can also be read as a coming of age novel. But with its movement from down south to up north, Invisible Man emulates the traditional slave narrative. It also incorporates numerous elements unique to black culture, such as a focus on black folklore and black vernacular, an emphasis on wordplay signifying, and the use of code switching, which Ellison refers to as reverse English. Consequently, it is clearly an African-American novel, although targeted primarily towards a white middle-class audience. Since the protagonist ultimately returns to his underground hideout, critics unfamiliar with Ellison's use of reverse English have described the novel as essentially a story of defeat. But Ellison denounces this egregious misreading. As he points out, the final act of Invisible Man is not that of a concealment in darkness in the Anglo-Saxon connotation of the word, the protagonists retreat into a coal cellar, a source of heat, light, and power is a process of rising to an understanding of the human condition. Ellison underscores the fact that the protagonist's internal landscape, rather than his physical environment, defines his sense of freedom and identity. For as the narrator states at one point, quote, when I discover who I am, I'll be free, unquote. As illustrated in these examples, neither approach, focusing primarily on a text's cultural elements or reading it through the lens of Western culture, acknowledges the unique contributions of individual authors. In her essay, Moving Out Beyond Yourself, Natalie Goldberg, a Jewish American writer, describes her frustrations on struggling to grasp the unique vision and narrative structure of Leslie Mar Marmon Silko's ceremony. The novel tells the story of Tayo, a mixed race Indian and World War II, suffer World War II veteran suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder who returns to his Navajo community, a broken man. Having exhausted the limits of Western medicine, Tayo's only hope for recovery is a traditional ceremony performed by a local healer. With its numerous flashbacks, its circular narrative structure, and its emphasis on oral tradition, such as songs, stories, and prayers, the novel defies any attempts to fit into a Western linear narrative structure. My mind couldn't grasp this, states Goldberg. I was used to novels formed by white culture and the way they saw the world. I was comfortable with that. The story was set up, you entered and were carried along down the book. This was stretching my brain. I was afraid it would snap. Goldberg's experience reflects that of many readers raised on Western classics. But Goldberg recognizes that her frustration stems from her lack of knowledge concerning Native American culture and literature as well as her failure to understand the unique vision and narrative structure of Silco's novel. And she admits that she is not mentally or emotionally prepared to enter into Silco's world. But several weeks later, she again picks up the novel and approaches it from a fresh perspective. This time, 
she finds herself engaged in the narrative and able to connect with both the novel and its author. Unlike Goldberg, few readers who encounter works that challenge their preconceived notions of literature will take time to process their reactions and find new ways to enter a text. Instead, they are more likely to dismiss the work as too complex or attempt to read it through the lens of Western culture, which as noted earlier, can lead to egregious misreadings. But where do these preconceptions originate? What are the other paradigms Morrison alludes to and the novels formed by white culture Goldberg mentions? To address these questions, we must begin by exploring the text and context of a novel that virtually every American student has encountered at some point, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. According to Ernest Hemingway, quote, all modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn, unquote. Published in 1885, Twain's novel tells the story of Huck Finn, a 12-year-old white boy from rural Mississippi who runs away from home to escape the violence and restrictions of his family and community, symbolized by his violent alcoholic father who abuses him and by the pious widow Douglas who tries to civilize him. Along the way, he meets the enslaved African nigger Jim and decides to help him escape. Together, the two embark on a journey down the mighty Mississippi, seeking freedom and independence. Since we accept Twain as an American author, we overlook the fact that he is a white Southern writer born and raised in Mississippi, who even spent time as a Confederate soldier. We also ignore the fact that he is writing through the lens of white Southern culture. On the other hand, we find it difficult to accept Amy Tan and Ralph Ellison as simply American authors. Consequently, we tend to focus on their respective cultures as opposed to their literary works. For as Morrison points out, quote, American means white and Africanist people struggle to make the term applicable to themselves with ethnicity and hyphen after hyphen after hyphen, unquote. In her analysis of Huckleberry Finn, Morrison reveals that, quote, fear and alarm are what I remember most about my first encounter with the novel, unquote, which she describes as deeply disturbing. I experienced a similar sensation on my first encounter with the novel. So did my sisters, so did my son. Undoubtedly, for students of color, much of the fear and alarm stems from the word nigger sprinkled liberally throughout the text. Clearly, Twain recognized the value of repetition as an effective rhetorical device. Yet, one wonders what compelled him to repeat the racial slur 219 times in the space of 320 pages. But Morrison focuses on an issue that resonates at a deeper level. As she points out, two things strike us in this novel, the apparently limitless store of love and compassion the black man has for his white friend and white masters, and his assumption that the whites are indeed what they say they are, superior and adult. This representation of Jim as the visible other can be read as the yearning of whites for forgiveness and love, but the yearning is made possible only when it is understood that Jim has recognized his inferiority, not as slave, but as black and despises it. Huckleberry Finn illustrates the other paradigms that pe perpetuate the myth of white supremacy through characteristics such as the following. The reading audience is presumed to be white. Unless noted otherwise, characters are assumed to be white. The text perpetuates the beliefs and values presented in classic Western literature as universal. 
the text presents the culture of white Eurocentric Americans as the default culture. But Huckleberry Finn does not stand alone in its negative portrayal of African Americans. We must also consider the profound impact of two other classic texts, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which established the image of Africa as the dark continent and its inhabitants as wild black savages, and Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, which created a nostalgia for the antebellum South when whites ruled over massive plantations and their black slaves toiled in the fields. Heart of Darkness invariably appears on the required reading lists of little liberal arts majors. While, student, while Gone with the Wind, first published in 1936, ranked second only to the Bible among American readers. To counter the devastating impact of racism and make their voices heard, writers of color often began by imitating the works of Western writers in an attempt to appeal to white audiences. But as they began to recognize the power of their own stories and the importance of writing for their own people, they began to celebrate their own cultures. In her TED talk, The Danger of the Single Story, Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie describes her coming of age as a writer. Beginning with humorous anecdotes that illustrate the powerful impact of British literature on her development, Adichie ruefully recalls writing the kinds of stories she was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow, they ate apples, <laughs> and they talked a lot about the weather how lovely it was that the sun had come out. Now this despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria. We didn't have snow, we ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. Adichie concludes that her experience demonstrates, quote, how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, particularly as children, unquote. She notes that later in her career, quote, because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Lay, I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose kinky hair could not form ponytails, could also exist in literature. Consequently, she notes, quote, I started to write about things I recognized. Unquote. Adichie is the author of numerous novels, including Purple Hibiscus, Half of a Yellow Sun, and Americana. Each novel reflects the unique culture of Nigeria and, like Silco Ceremony, makes no attempts to appeal to a Western audience. To counter the conventions of Western Eurocentric text and challenge the notion of the Western of the notion that Western values are universal and represent the default culture, writers of color have created their own unique literatures. Adopting a culturally responsive approach to reading will help us connect with their works by focusing on issues such as the following. The author's language, the author's worldview, the author's message and major themes, the text's narrative structure and main characters, the emotional tone evoked by words, images, and metaphors, the text cultural and historical context, and the text's connections to our lives. Asked to comment on the difference between Western and African-American literature, Toni Morrison emphasized the critical role of literature and in transmitting a people's culture. Viewed from this perspective, she points out that African-American literature, quote, is richer. It has more complex sources. It pulls from something that's closer to the edge. It has a human future. Thank you. <laughs>